been around already. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, so we're going to have um, our second talk um, today, uh, titled Basic EEG for the Non-Neurologist. Uh, based on my short reading, uh, my short investi um, research uh, yesterday, okay, the idea of EEG in emergency department has been uh, uh, suggested, okay, to be to be made available in EEG uh, since I think early 2000s. Uh, however, due to uh, some logistic reason, for example, there is no time to do EEG. Uh, and then the technicality of performing the EEG, interpreting the EEG, so it's not really possible for EEG to be available in EEG. And what Prof. Lim said not just now, it's not really a priority at this moment, especially in our country. Perhaps in Western country, okay, uh, it is possible, but uh, uh, in our country, there's a lot more things need to be done. However, um, I think it would be interesting as well for us to know some basic things about EEG. All this time, okay, our main investigation is there is acute neurological uh, conditions, it, it is always CT scan. Okay? Uh, perhaps EEG has a role as well, especially in non-convulsive status abilities and also altered consciousness level. Okay, so for the second talk, uh, we have Dr. Benjamin Ng Hansim, uh, currently a neurologist in Hospital Cebu. Uh, he has done also a, a clinical fellowship in epilepsy in Australia. Okay, um, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Ben to give his talk about basic EEG interpretation for the non-neurologist. Over to you, Dr. Ben. Thank you, Dr. East and the organizer. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning. I'm truly honored to be given this opportunity to, to talk. Being a novice in this field, you know, it's really an opportunity for me, especially sharing the same session with Prof Lim, who is my mentor in University of Malaya. So I'm going to share my screen now. Can everyone see my screen? Oops. Yes. Okay. Um, when I was given this uh this topic to talk on basic EEG for non-neurologists by Nasrina, I was indeed very overwhelmed because uh, you know, I need to cram up all the EEG basics into one lecture, in one hour lectures. So, you know. I try to cram it up, try my best, but I would like to apologize if I don't reach your expectation. So I'm a neurologist in Cebu Hospital for those that don't know where is Cebu. Cebu is actually at the central of Sarawak. It's a district hospital with specialists. So to start my the ball rolling, outline of my talk will be, I will be touching on the history, basic interpretation. Then we will talk about indication, when to order EEG. Some terminologies that you can see in EEG report, some misconception. And EEG, in my talk, refer to electroencephalogram. It's actually a recording of the brain wave. It's not the e EKG that we use for uh, heart rhythm. When we talk about history of EEG, EEG has been referred since the year 1875. That was the time where they, they tried to to describe this uh, electrical phenomenon in uh, experiment animal until 1924 when Dr. Hans Berger recorded the first human EEG. Ironically, to my, our surprise is um, Dr. Hans Berger is actually a psychiatrist, but nowadays um, psychiatrists don't do EEG. So it's a big surprise here. So what I want to show is this picture actually shows Dr. Hans Berger taken from the internet. And also, if you look at the image to the right side, it's actually an EEG recording that actually shows an alpha rhythm. And for your, for your information, alpha rhythm was also known as uh, Burgess rhythm, named after him. So like Hang Fung, we got new model and old model. So for EEG, many years ago, they have this uh, known as an analog 
EEG machine, whereby it's a very bulky one where all the recording will be traced on the paper. The encephalographer need to report the EEG uh, by flipping through all this paper recording tracing. Whereas in the modern days, like what we have for iPhone, we have this digital EEG machine whereby everything is digital, meaning that all the EEG signal will be recorded in the computer. And we can actually interpret by using the computer and also change the montages and other configuration using a, a modern EEG digital type. For the placement of electrode, there's this system known as a 1020 system. 10 and 20 system referring to the percentage. Why is it percentage and it's not a recording, uh, it's not a direct measurement because everyone's uh, head is different. Same goes to pediatric and adult where you expect pediatric head, uh, the, the pediatric patient's head will be smaller compared to adult. So they implement this uh, 1020 whereby uh, what you do is uh, you actually take an anatomical landmark. For instance, if you if I if you could see at uh, diagram A, they use this anatomical landmark of nation or uh, inyong. From there, they measure and they divide. For example, if the distance between nation and inyong is forty centimeter, then thanks ten percent of this forty centimeter will be four centimeter. So from there, they actually place the electrode. And for those that are not very no don't really know about this uh, EEG nomenclature, we used to give alphabet, F for frontal, C for central, O for occipital, Z for midline, T for temporal, and FP for frontal polar. And after this alphabet, there are numbers. Odd numbers like one, three, five, seven refer to the left side, whereas even number two, four, six, eight refer to the right side. When we talk about electrical potential recorded in the EEG, we, we, we actually record it based on this channel, whereby a channel is linking input one from one electrode to input two of another electrode. The net output of a channel is reflected either as a negative or positive potential. If it's a negative potential, then it will be an upward deflection. Whereas for positive, it will be a downward deflection. As shown in this cartoon, whereby you can see that there's this uh, so-called phase reversal that you can see between channel one and channel two. This uh, phase reversal shows that this is the area with the maximum potential. Whereas if I can draw your attention to channel P8 to O2, is actually isoelectric. Isoelectric doesn't mean that the channel is silent or inactive. It just shows that there's a possibility that the electrode one and the electrode two have the same potential. So they tend to cancel out and causing an isoelectric line in the EEG. When we talk about EEG, the te te technical terminology, there's a, a few terms that we need to know. For instance, if you look at this uh, image on top, FP1 is an electrode. When FP1 is linked to F7, then this is a channel. And a group of channel that group together, it will become a chain. And when this different chain, they configure it together to a topography map, then it's known as a montage. There are a lot of brain waves. Since the, the era of Hans Berger, we know that there's a lot of brain wave and different brain wave uh, you can see in different state, like the awake state, drowsy state, and sleeping. Okay, and usually what we do is we, we, we tend to classify this wave based on the frequency. When you talk about frequency, you actually take a one second period and you see how many waves you can see there. Like for instance, if you look at the, the fourth row on deep sleep, in one second, you got two deflections. So it's two hertz. And you know that anything less than 3.5 hertz are considered delta. So the same goes with the upper row, awake with mental activity. If it's, uh, if it's more than... Um, so you, what you do is uh, in one second, you count the number of waves. From there, you, you classify the waveform. 
And if you look at the images over your right side, it actually shows the different brain activity with different state, whereby in um, sleep, in sleep, it's further divided to stage one, stage two, and then you got this uh, deep sleep, which last time used to known as the uh, stage three and four, and also you got REM sleep. I'm going to show it with this uh, di this uh, diagram, whereby what I try to say is there's a different stages in EEG, it's a continuum. When I'm talking to you, when you are listening to me, you are in the awake state, you know, and when you if you find my, my presentation is boring, then you go into drowsy, you know, and then if uh, you can't, uh, you're not aroused, let's say your environment is very cooling, right? From drowsy, you actually go into a sleep and you follow these stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and then you go to do this uh, REM sleep. So a sleep cycle typically take about 90, 90 to 120 minutes. And during your nighttime sleep, you actually have about like three to five sleep cycle throughout your whole night. This, uh, this EEG actually, I got it from the internet, which I think is quite interesting in the sense that there's a lot of labeling. This EEG is a wake EEG recording that shows a posterior dominant rhythm of about 10 hertz. Why is it known as posterior dominant rhythm? Because you can appreciate that the, the activity is the most uh, well-formed towards the, the back of it. Like you see P4O2, you see that the, the, the alpha activity is very well-formed. It looks a bit sinusoidal. Whereas if you go to the front, this activity is not that well-formed. And there is a eye closure and eye, eye opening artifact when the eye close, this alpha activity will become more prominent. That shows that, that this is a reactive recording. And if you look at the 10 hertz, why is it 10 hertz? Because in one second, you can actually calculate there's actually 10, 10 waveform in one second. So it's known as a 10 hertz. This is another EEG epoch that actually shows that Compare this one and the previous one, you can see that the alpha activity is not that obvious posteriorly. You don't really see it. And then you don't really see this eye opening, eye closure artifact that was seen earlier on. But however, if I may draw your attention to the frontal leak like FP1, F7, FP2, FP2 and F8, you can see that there's this uh, very slow horizontal eye movement this actually signifies that this is a drowsy state. And if you look at the frontal central, you can see that there's a lot of uh, this low amplitude fast activity um, in the beta range that, that signify that this is a drowsy state together with this alpha drop up, whereby you don't really see alpha in the background. As we go further, then the sleep transient will come, come out. So, Sorry, I go to stage two because there's supposed to be one, one more stage is known as a stage one where you can get this uh, vertex wave and also this posterior hospital sleep transient. And as you go into deeper sleep to stage two, then you will get this sleep spindle and K complexes. And as uh, the, you, you go into further sleep, what happens is the slow wave start to appear. This is known as a slow wave of sleep. Last I used to known as stage three and stage four of non-REM. And after the non-REM, you go into REM sleep, whereby the eye is actively moving. You can actually see that the eye movement there, the, the circle, you can see that the eye is actually moving very fast. Okay. And the, the alpha, the, the background reader actually shows a theta sawtooth morphology, especially over the central. And there's an overall absence of muscle artifact. And if you put in an electrode to record the EMG activity, there should be atonia during this stage. So why is it important to know awake state, drowsy state, and sleep state? Partly because uh, if you fail to realize uh, that what you are looking is a sleep stage, you may mistakenly uh, take the sleep transient as an epileptic discharge. That's why the very basic of interpretation of an EEG would be to know the state, awake, drowsy, and sleep. And let's move further. There's this thing known as normal barium in EEG, 
which uh, they are the those uh, EEG activity with rhythmic pattern or so-called epileptic form morphology, which is indeed non-epileptogenic, seeing asymptomatic healthy individual. There are a lot of normal barrier. We need to know this because we, again, we don't want to mistaken this normal barrier as something abnormal. And because of that, we actually overtreat the patient. We give a wrong diagnosis to the patient and patient will, will, will take this uh, wrong labeling of the diagnosis for the rest of his or her life. So there are a lot of normal variants which I have uh, included in this uh, slide. And normal variant, if you want to think of, you can think it as uh, like this picture, you know, it's actually a kitten wearing a costume of a tiger. The tiger is the epileptic form, the abnormal finding, whereas the kitten are the normal variant. So take home message is do not mistaken a kitten for a tiger. In this slide, I show two examples of EEG recording. So I would like to ask the audience, which one you think is normal? And which one you think is abnormal? The left one is normal, abnormal. The right one, normal or abnormal. You can write in the chat. Yeah, Prof Lim, the kitten is very cute. <laughs> So the, the, the left side one is a, is a wicked spike, it's a normal variant, okay? But it have this sharp morphology that may be mistaken as abnormal, but it doesn't really stand up from the background, you know, as compared to the right one. The right one is a temporal epileptic form discharge, whereby you got this, uh, it stand up from the background. There's a lot of sharp followed by uh, after slow wave, and also there's a feel to it. So the right one is the abnormal one. The left one, left one is a is a barrier. So important to identify normal barrier to avoid over reporting, over calling an EEG report. And you know when you see this type of situation, always go back to your clinical equity and judgment because seizure is a clinical diagnosis. And wicked spikes are the most common EEG barrier mistaken as pathological finding. And like I say just now, it's very important to differentiate between a cat and a tiger. So the next thing would be artifact in EEG. Those are electrical potential recorded, re recorded during EEG that do not originate in the brain. It can be biological or non-biological. Sometimes can be helpful. Like, you know, the, the first EEG that I show you, right? You got eye closure, eye opening. This signifies awake state. So this is a useful artifact and those slow horizontal eye movement that signify a drowsy state. However, this artifact can be nuisance at time, like those, you know, needle-like myogenic artifact mistaken as pathological epileptic form discharges. Those are the nuisance that you need to, you know, when you see artifact, uh, you always ask yourself, is this, uh, is this real or not real? You know, and, and if it's not real, it's an artifact, then you have to think of whether is it a helpful one or a nuisance one. This, uh, this illustration shows some artifact like chewing. Chewing movement, what happens is when you eat something, right? You, you tend to uh, activate your temporal list. So because of that, it can cause myogenic artifact. And it became periodic because of your chewing movement. That is uh, intermittently when you're chewing it, then you can have this uh, uh, periodicity that may be mistaken as a periodic discharge if you're not aware of this artifact. And also your patient on ventilator, they can have this type of uh, um, electrical activity that is in sync with the ventilator rate. This may also cause you to think that patient have this, uh, you know, like lateralized periodic discharges. You may mistaken it as something abnormal. So take home message is always think of artifact before you commit that the EEG is abnormal. Next, we go to abnormal EEG. When we talk about abnormal EEG, we will divide to non-epileptic form and epileptic form. Non-epileptic form refers to slowing, which can be regional or diffuse. And epileptic form uh, can be divided into regional and generalized. I always remember epileptic form as something that is sharp that can break your fingers. This was uh, actually taught by me by a prominent professor that everyone will know. Prof. Raymond. And 
Yeah, so I'm showing a non-epileptic form slowing. To your left side, you can see that this is a diffuse slowing or a generalized slowing. And to your right, it's a regional slowing over the right temporal chain. Slowing in EEG is non-specific abnormality, meaning that if you get a if you get a report saying that there's a generalized slowing, it never tell you the etiology. It just tell you that how good is the brain. That's all. And slowing can be intermittent or continuous. If you get intermittent, it, it point towards a dysfunction cerebrum. And if it's continuous, then you need to think of structural abnormality like a stroke. When you talk about abnormal EEG, epileptic form discharges, again, it can be generalized or diffused. Like what has been shown here is a, this a classical generalized 3 hertz spike and wave that you can see in certain um, genetic epilepsy. And to your right is actually a regional temporal epileptic form discharges. When you look at EEG, sometimes the, the, the person that report will say that there are EEG seizure recorded. So what are EEG seizures? They are actually a series of epileptic form discharge occurring with a frequency of more than 2.5 hertz, lasting for more than 10 seconds with definite evolution, with a clear onset and offset. For example, if you look at this diagram, what you can see that over the left frontal temporal chain, you can see that there's actually some rhythmic delta activity. As you go through the EEG, you can see that there's evolution, the frequency catch up to theta, the morphology also changes. And also it's spread to the other chain, it's spread to the left front, frontal central chain. So this is considered an EEG seizure. And when you look at the report, there's always this term that we need to uh, know. There's always this pre ictor ictor and post ictor pre ictor is before the seizure. ictor refers to during the seizure. post ictor is after the seizure. And, we, and when you talk about inter ictor it means that it's between the seizure when the patient is not having the seizure. So when you talk about this terminology, there's one more, um, there's one more borderland, I would say, whereby it's known as an ictor inter ictor continuum. So in, in inter 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 continuum is actually EEG activity that doesn't qualify as an unequivocal seizure. It means that it's not an EEG seizure. Yet there is reasonable chance that it might contribute to impair a learner's symptoms or neuronal injury. So pattern of IIC, uh, some of the pattern is like this, like periodic discharge, spike wave, averaging 1 to 2.5 over 10 seconds. If you go back to my EEG seizure, you know that one of the criteria for EEG seizure is more than 10 seconds with a frequency of more than 2.5. So anything less than that uh, is, uh, consider, is considered in, into this uh, continuum of IIC. Okay, and also there's this lateralized rhythmic delta activity. The most common IIC will be these lateralized periodic discharges, whereby you can actually get this uh, epileptic form discharges that occur in a periodic ma manner confined to one hemisphere. It could be quasi-periodic. This is the one that you classically describe in HSB encephalitis. However, it's also seen in structural abnormality, let's say like in a MCA territory stroke. And this is a generalized periodic discharge, generalized because it is actually generalized. It, it doesn't confine to one hemisphere. So IIC is a clinical conundrum because we, we weren't very sure, you know, like how aggressive to treat, what is the extent for neural damage if not treated. No one have an answer, you know, a definite answer. However, present or plus feature, let's say you get the EEG, you think it's an IIC, but there is a superimposed fast activity. There was a fluctuation. Fluctuation is a criteria used uh, that things that you see there's a uh, evolving, but it doesn't qualify into evolution. That is considered a fluctuation if you follow the ACNS criteria definition. So if you have this plus feature, means that there are higher risks and you probably want to err towards the ictor end. And IIC, the recommendation is for prolonged EEG recording. Unfortunately, it's not 
readily available in most of the hospital, especially those in district. And I would suggest an individualized approach. If you see the case, if you think it's high risk of seizure, let's say, for example, patient actually came in with seizure, but now you don't see any clinical seizure, patient is not waking up comatose, there's ongoing deterioration, then probably you like to treat as a seizure. If patient improving and your neuroimaging per se, like you, you do a CT scan and you noted that there's an MCA stroke, well established, then, you know, or patient is improving, then probably you can just wash and wait. However, when you have this type of patient, if there's any time lock motor coloration or any unequal vocal evolution to suggest EEG seizure, then this EEG pattern is no longer considered IIC. It's considered as an EEG seizure. So indication for EEG request in the emergency setting, um, I would say there's few cry few indication um, arise, although it's not very important to do it step for every of your patient, but there are patients that, you know, critical ill patient in whom non-compulsive status is suspected, cases with frustrating consciousness, inappropriate behavior, subtle motor manifestation, those comatose patients with disconcordant clinical neuroimaging coloration. What I mean is disconcordant in this respect. What I mean is like, let's say, for example, you get a patient came in, conscious level wasn't good, you intubated for airway protection, you done a neuroimaging and to your surprise, uh, the CT scan looks normal, you don't see any obvious lesion, there was no bleed, there was no infarct, but patient is not waking up. So this is known as a disconcordant. This type of patient, you probably want to do an EEG to, to make sure you're not missing a non-convulsive status. And for patient treated for status epilepticus, those that already intubated, sedated, you know, where you can't really see the clinical manifestation because of the anesthetic agent, then probably you like to do an EEG, you know, to make sure that, again, you don't miss out a non-convulsive status epilepticus. In this respect, actually, ACNS recommend continuous EEG recording. However, this is not readily available in our setting. How about those non-emergency setting? EEG requires the indication is to identify epilepsy type focal, generalized as the treatment may di differ, identify epilepsy syndrome like childhood onset um, epsilon epilepsy, and in various neurologic conditions like those patients with this diffuse disturbance of cerebral dysfunction, intracranial disease process like a tumor. And also EEG is rarely also used as part of brain death determination in those uh, in those cases where there's no uh, not ambiguous cases lah, as part of an ancillary testing, but this is not a mandatory for brain death determination. When you look at the report, there's always this term that come out, diffuse cerebral dysfunction. Um, this, is, this term is actually also the same with encephalopathy, cortical dysfunction. Again, it's non-specific finding can be seen in various cerebral pathological condition. As for the staging, there are still ongoing debate. For me uh, personally, I like to grade it as mild, moderate, severe, and based on certain feature, I may classify it as mild, moderate, or severe. But Personally, I feel staging is not relevant except when it is done serially and reported by the same person because there's not a standardized um, staging for encephalopathy. And often there's always this indication to rule out seizure and epilepsy, which I find a bit absurd because uh, seizure and epilepsy are clinical diagnosis. Your EEG finding act as a supportive tool coupled with appropriate critical context. Epilepsy patient can have normal EEG report, meaning that if you want to rule out a seizure, you've done an EEG, uh, it's reported as normal. It doesn't say that the patient don't have seizure or epilepsy uh, because you still have to go back to the clinical aspect. And normal individual can have abnormal finding in their EEG recording. You know, like for example, those patients uh, where they have family history of uh, genetic generalized epilepsy, when you do an EEG for them, they don't have seizure. But when you do the photic stimulation, they can actually have this uh, self-limited photoparosima event. It's considered a familiar trait for IgE, but the patient himself doesn't have epilepsy or seizure. 
So be wary of some statement in the EEG report, like, you know, those phrases like, you know, suspicious or borderline abnormal, ambiguous or beating around the bush, ah, when you're not very sure after reporting, ah, always go back to the clinical aspect of the case, ask yourself whether the parasomal is when it's actually a seizure. And, you know, you can always call the person who report the EEG for clarification. Like, you know, you call me back, hey, what do you mean ah, by uh, borderline, ah, suggest repeat, ah, you know, we welcome you calling us for clarification. And there's also no harm to repeat another EEG, perhaps a prolonged sleep deprived recording if clinically indicated. And remember, EEG is there to support your clinical judgment, not to detect your management as you are treating the patient, not the EEG. So my last few slides, bear with me. I always remember this question by Prof. Raymond. He asked us this during my student time. EKG or EEG, which is harder? Well, until now, I don't have the answer. Perhaps I think both, both is also very difficult, I, I would say, but you know, it's uh, mandatory to know, to, to improve our patient's care. We only touch on the SCARP EEG. There are more sophisticated EEG recording, like the intracranial EEG, stereo EEG recording, and also this uh, subdural uh, grid recording or ECOX. And with that, I thank you. This is the device that I tried it on myself while I attended a, a conference in India. But personally, I don't have experience using this. And suggested resources for EEG basic will be uh, these few resources. And last but not least, I would like to invite you to Cebu for our local event in May, whereby we'll be talking about acute neurology and neuroimaging in the update. With that, I thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben, uh, for the talk on the basic EEG. Okay. Uh, for me personally, it's a totally new uh, knowledge to learn. Uh, still a lot to learn. Okay. Uh, perhaps uh, we have a few more examples. Okay. We are familiar. Okay. Like EEG, okay. like ECG, we have to look at a lot of ECG in order to understand it. Okay, um, so uh, hopefully we have the opportunity to, uh, to look uh, uh, at the further EEG imaging and then learn from the report that uh, come with the EEG. Okay, um, yes, uh, Dr. Naslina, you have questions? Uh, hi, Ben. Thank you for your presentation. would like to ask, um, okay, um, is everyone... Even though the history is very clear cut of a certain type of seizure, like a focal seizure or generalized seizure, it mandatory for them to go through an EG because, as you mentioned, the EG can be normal. So, uh, what is your take of this? Uh, that that is a very good question, Nasrina. So, you usually I will go clinical first. I, I will actually explore the history and also the clinical semiology, and if I think it's a seizure, I will actually treat and. Like I say just now, the, the EG is just uh, to support my clinical judgment. So um, if let's say you have a patient that has a clear-cut history of a certain type of seizure, uh, if the EG is, is, is normal, will you dismiss the diagnosis? Or is it right for people to dismiss the diagnosis? Yeah, that's another very practical question. So you know, EEG, right? If it's a normal, it doesn't say that you rule out epilepsy seizure for that patient. Because again, those patients can actually have a normal EEG. We are talking about a 30 minutes recording to one hour recording. It can be normal. So the question is, you can't use EEG to rule out the diagnosis of epilepsy or seizure. Okay, so because I've seen few patients coming to us that uh, they have had few episodes of seizure, but the EEG was normal and therefore was not being started on any anti-seizure therapy. So what is actually uh, should be done for this patient is to have a longer EEG monitoring, correct? Yeah, I would, I would suggest to... Let, uh, first thing first, we go to the history, explore the semiology. I will ask for video if possible. And mm -hmm. also I would like to see whether are those like very stereotyped from one event to another. And when, when mm -hmm. I feel that the suspicious for seizure is quite high, what I will do is I will suggest a prolonged EEG recording with a sleep deprivation. 
And in my setting in a district hospital, I will actually go for a one hour to four hours, de depends on my clinical suspicion. Okay. Um, second question. Sorry for asking a lot of questions. Hey, uh, no problem, no problem. Feel <laughs> free to ask. Yeah, doing an EG, um, because I'm not very sure, is it uh, only an expertise which can be offered in a centre with neurologists around or can it be done in a centre without neurologists but you have an electrophysiologist to do it and the neurologist will interpret it? How, how, does, the, how does it work? Okay, when, when I was not in Cebu, I just reported to Cebu uh, oh. early of this year. So oh. what happened is... Uh, I was in Kuching last year. So what happened is uh, the physician will call me for cases suspect seizure. When I Then I will order an EEG. My MA in Cebu will do the EEG and actually Google Drive to me. So I will read the EEG instantly and feedback to the physician. That is how I, 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 I do it in, to support a district hospital without neurologists. So I think it's doable. I see. So is this the same in uh, Semenanjung, Malaysia as well? Or is it just in your centre? Semenanjung, so usually what they do is uh, they will actually do the EEG and bring it into a CD, then send over to HKL for reporting. Um, I'm okay. talking about KKM. Lah. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right. Okay, thanks. And also like Prof Lim say, you know, you can actually take a WhatsApp of the EEG and send over to the neurologist and we can try to, you know, challenge ourselves to read the so-called EEG video in the WhatsApp video. But it has <laughs> a lot of WhatsApp video, right? <laughs> we are engaging a uh, apps company who which oh. allow us to share EEG, uh, oh. which will slightly happen next year. I see that that is a great effort. Mm. But for the moment, as what Ben mentioned, it is mostly send the CD over or share using Google Drive. So uh, from the neurology side, you won't be able to admin or take the history by yourself. So it will all be provided by the physician uh, who is actually treating the patient, correct? Yeah, most of the time that's the case, but sometimes when we read EEG, we feel that there's some abnormality, we may call back the physician and ask him or her to explore back the history again. Okay. And try to okay. send some videos of the so-called seizure for us to scrutinize the semiology. Okay, sure. All right. Any other questions? Uh, okay, Dr. Ben. Dr. Is. I think there's one in the chat box. Can we do EEG okay. in ED with a lot of background noise? Well, yeah, it's a practical question. Uh, it's very challenging because uh, a lot of background noises, not only in ED, I like see also there's a lot of background noises, but you know, if the indication is there, want to make sure it's a non-compulsive, we will try to do. But technically, it's very challenging, especially to get the impedance and to eliminate the 60 hertz artifact uh, in the EEG recording. But the answer is yes, we will try to do if there's a strong clinical indication. Uh, so I think the eight leads EEG, which is actually the one that you try, I think I believe that one is a product of New Hong Kong then, is it correct? Because yeah. Yeah, I um, what, what what do you think about the eight leads EG? Uh, I'm sure that it cannot make up any diagnosis, but do you think it's adequate to uh, pick up any uh epilepsy form um which is enough for us to uh conduct or manage the patient by using AEDs? I for my personal opinion, I may be wrong, but you know, with the limited electrode, uh, I feel that sometimes seizure like focal seizure, you may miss it. Because the, the area of the seizure may not be covered with this, this limited electrode configuration. But if you say about those like generalized seizure, uh, then probably you can capture it. But you know, talking about that status epilepticus, most of the time they are compulsive, whereby you clinically yeah. there's a manifestation, jerking, everything, you know, you can just go clinically, I feel. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Ben, uh, you mentioned that there are few indications, emergent indications, uh, but how, how soon should we do the uh, EEG in those emergent indications for EEG? Um, yeah, good question. 
So usually uh, EEG, what I will do is uh, while I was in Kuching that time, when they call me middle of the night, they say that they have a patient status epilepticus, they are loading with phenytoin or Capra, they are going to intubate. I will ask them to go on with the intubation, stabilization, give the medication. The next day when I see the patient, I will actually just order EEG to make sure that patient is not having a non-convulsive. So the, the answer to your question is probably after a few hours after stabilization. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, any other questions from the participant to the speakers today? Dr. Nasrina, any more questions? <laughs> I mean in the chat. Oh, in Do you chat, want me to I, I answer is... that question? Hmm. Somehow I couldn't see the uh, question in the chat. Okay, okay sorry. The it, question uh, is directly there. to me. Yeah, directed to me. So All it's right. by Dr. Yuan. Uh, uh, inpatient with neuropsychiatric yeah, SLE who fitted continuously with a high BP, would you still aggressively give AEDs after diazepam and controlling the BP would be more useful? Mm. So she, the patient is talking, the, the question is about SLE and the patient had seizure and high blood pressure. Uh, most often, treating seizure and blood pressure are separate, separate uh, issue, although it is slightly correlated. Now. So what are the things that can cause high blood pressure in SLE? It could be uh, increased intracranial pressure, secondary to sagittal vein thrombosis like antiphospholipid syndrome. And therefore, patient may have sagittal vein thrombosis with uh, venous infarct, and which lead to seizure. And uh, my management of this, or in general, management of any status epilepticus, we manage both manage the seizure as well as manage the underlying cause. So uh, the seizure, we still treat aggressively, but the underlying cause, we need to do further assessment and uh, treat uh, the cause uh, based on the investigation's results. Okay, uh, that, is that answer the question uh, for the doctor who asked? Dr. Yuan. Dr. Yuan. I think it's a private message, a private chat because I couldn't read it. Hopefully, it answered the question. Okay, Dr. Nasrina, again, are there you have okay. questions? All right. Um, I, 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 in relation to Dr. Uh, e's question, um, okay, if a patient, very stable one, had a first episode of seizure in his or her life, how fast uh, it is recommended for this patient to have an EEG um, uh, being done for this patient um, to support the diagnosis of the whatever seizure that the patient has? Yeah, um, perhaps I can answer this question. So uh, just a recap. So you are saying that a patient with a first onset of seizure, how soon to do the EEG? Is exactly. that right, Asrita? Yes, yeah, the patient is quite stable, not in a status epilepticus or anything. The patient calm, admitted, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so ideally, <laughs> I, ideally EEG should be done uh, as early as possible because the yield will be highest uh, if you do it early. But in our setting whereby we have a lot of admission, you know, just uh, keeping the patient just for EEG sometimes is not so practical in KKM, whereby there's a lot of patient with a big allocation issue. So for my practice, usually what I will do is I will try to do it on the same day, the EEG. If I can't, I will do it within a week and I will see back the patient in the clinic and discuss again about the EEG uh, with, with the patient. Okay, so is and it... And of course, during the so-called one week, I will ask patient not to drive, you know, try to avoid activity that may, 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 may have, may be high risk if he or she have seizure, further seizure. Okay, so um, in a way that like maybe one week or two weeks will be, will be the best timing because I see one, a lot... One to two weeks, yeah. One to two weeks because that is the time that we can get a quite good epileptic form if there is any, right? Um, if you if you delay it, one is you may actually uh, that period of time where you don't start treatment, right, is actually considered a bit high risk for patient. And then uh, the second reason being that the earlier you do, the yield will be higher. Okay. All right. Thanks. 
Dr. Chow has yeah. a question. Yeah. Yeah. I think I yeah. saw Dr. the Chow? question. Yeah. 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 Hi, Dr. Chow. Hi, Ben. Thank you. For, thank you for the talk. No problem. Uh, uh, just a quick question. Uh, actually, I'm asking on behalf of my consultant. So, uh, is there a role of EEG in the end of life uh, decision making in ED? Not uh, we are not talking about uh brain death lah, but can EEG help us in uh this end of life decision? Um, I would say that depend on your clinical, your your clinical judgment because like you don't want to obviously you don't want to miss up a treatable causes like a non-convulsive in your patient before you know they are giving this DNR order. So I think there may be some role of EEG in this type of case. But if let's say you get a patient already clear cut, it's a stage four lung CA, then with an advanced directive, not for CPR, everything. And then if you get this type of case, then it's a bit different. Probably you can just skip the EEG. But if let's say you get a patient, you know, previously well and come in with a more rebound state, uh, I think EEG worth it to, to consider. Especially when your neuroimaging never show a structural, you know, pathological insult, then this type of case, you make sure you don't miss out a non-compulsive seizure. Thank you. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, Prof, uh, I have a uh, perhaps uh, not related to this talk. Uh, is there any um, like a uh, effort uh, to to get the government to not allowing patient who have epilepsy or under investigation for epilepsy not to try their car? Like uh, mm. so far, I don't think there is such a law uh, for us. For example, like in the UK, we can advise the patient you cannot drive for one or two years uh, before uh, after the treatment. Only can only then you can be allowed to drive. How about in Malaysia? Is there any effort to make such um, law to, yes. to our citizen? Hmm. So there's a very old uh, Akta Bangakutan saying that uh, patient with seizures cannot drive, uh, which is under the category of disability. But uh, in a few years ago, the rehab uh, team has come out with a rehab uh, guideline stated two years seizure free, then uh, the, they can drive. But most of us didn't follow that. And therefore, in the uh, started this year, late last year, uh, the Epilepsy Council has uh, agreed to look into this issue. Uh, we have uh, drafted the letter submitted to the Ministry of Health to ask for a, a call group, to form a call group to, to formulate or to generate a similar documents as what uh, we have in uh, UK and Australia. So sooner or later, this will come up, but in general rules, uh, one year seizure freedom is usually expected before someone is allowed to drive. One year seizure freedom. So we can just verbally suggest to patients not to drive. Following the UK yes, and yeah. Australian uh, regulations. But Malaysian one, uh, hopefully in the next two, three years, it will be for, it will be formulated. And, mm. Okay, all right. Okay, um, I think, I think that's all for today. Sorry about the disturbance because I'm... Okay, uh, okay, Dr. Chow. Okay, one last question. One last question from Dr. Chow. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, is, is there any specific waveform that can suggest uh, poor prognosis from, uh, let's say, a patient suffering a stroke or uh, suffer from a traumatic brain injury? Any specific waveform from the EEG that can tell, that can prognosticate? Thank you. I, I, I would say that that's a good question. Because uh, the my NS colleague always, uh, you know, they want this EEG to pronosticate their patient, you know, before terminal extubation, which uh, sometimes yeah. I find very challenging. Well, uh, those uh, the thing is when we talk about this encephalopathy, uh, when we talk about severe one, would be all those uh, patient without background reactivity, those suppressed background. And if you go to the uh, extreme end of the spectrum, then they, there will be this uh, electrocerebral silence. Uh. These are considered consider, uh, severe encephalopathy. La. Means the brain state is not good. You know? But bear in mind, all these changes also can be seen 
when patient is of anesthetic agent, means that anesthetic agent also can confound and cause this type of presentation. Yeah, so I, I would say that if you want to pronosticate a patient, not only EEG, la, you need to take other parameters like clinical parameter, what the neuroimaging, whether is it a very, very intimatous uh, brain, uh, any like herniation of have occurred, you cannot just base solely on EEG to pronosticate a patient. Thank you, thank you. Welcome. Okay, thank you for, for the answers. Okay, uh, I think uh, that's the end of our uh, CME today. Uh, on behalf of the Neuro Emergency uh, Special Interest Group uh, of College Emergency Physicians, I would like to thank again Prof Lim and Dr. Benjamin for the time that you spent uh, this morning to educate us uh, about status atheticus and also the EEG. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you again.